Out of the grass and desert shrublands of the Arizona desert emerges islands. And these are not what you would traditionally think of as islands. These are massive mountains that are radically different in flora and fauna than their surrounding desert climates. These mountains are known as the Madrian Sky Islands. They are my absolute favorite part of Arizona when it comes to hiking and just overall existing. They are part of the Basin and Range Province, which expands from parts of Mexico all the way up into the very northern parts of Nevada. But for the sake of this video, we're focused on this very little part of the Basin and Range called the Sierra Madre Occidental Islands, or the Madrian Sky Islands. So just a little overview on how these islands formed. They formed from horsed and graben topography, so as the crust extends, which was happening in the Basin and Range Province at the time, you get these faults, and if two normal faults form, it can create these areas where the crust sinks, forming grabens, which are valleys, and horse, which are above the grabens, which are ridges. Now, horse and graben topography alone cannot account for the large elevation that these mountains achieve. So we have to look to another geologic force called lithosphere delamination. So the crust, as well as a very tiny part of the upper mantle, are in this part of the earth called the lithosphere. And so very thick parts of the lithosphere can have the bottom parts of that lithosphere break off and go deeper down into the mantle, causing mantle upwelling, which fills those gaps and uplifts the terrain above it thus creating for bigger mountains and higher elevation valleys. Now, some of these mountains contain the five of the nine life zones found on Earth, and life zones are essentially just areas where the plants and animals are similar. But for the sake of this video, we're going to be talking about biomes, and these mountains tend to have eight. So let's go over all the eight biomes real quick. So first up we have the desert scrublands. This is where you're going to find your saguaro cactus as well as many other species of cacti as well as creosote bushes and a lot of other scrubs. Uh, these regions are generally going to be found in low elevation, 1 to 2,000 feet above sea level. Next up we have the desert grasslands. These are between like two to 3,000 feet above sea level. Lots of grass here, very cool during monsoon season, lots of flowers. Uh, this is where you're also going to find species of mesquite trees as well as yuccas. Next up we have the oak grasslands which is between three to four thousand feet elevation gain. This is where you're going to find Arizona white oak, emery oak, and Arizona juniper. Next we have the oak woodlands between four and five thousand feet elevation gain. This is where you're going to find every other oak I mentioned earlier along with Madrian oak. Next, we have the chaparral biome. This is where you're going to find pinyon pine, scrub oak, agave, juniper, and manzanita. Next, we got the pine oak woodlands. This is where you're going to find a lot of the species of oak I previously mentioned, along with ponderosa pine, as well as Douglas fir. It's between around five to 6,000 feet above sea level. Next, we have the pine forest biome at around six to 7,000 feet above sea level. This is where you're going to find a lot of those pine trees I mentioned earlier. This is where a lot of the oak gets shred off, but you still see some gamble oak and the addition of white pine. Last up, between seven to 11,000 feet above sea level, we have the mixed conifer biome. This is where you're going to see a lot of those pine trees and conifers I mentioned beforehand, but also with the addition of quaking aspen. This is also the wettest region of the mountain, and this is why. As Pacific storms as well as monsoonal storms come to these mountains, the water that's inside of these storm clouds condenses as it travels up the slopes of the mountains and becomes colder, thus allowing for a lot more rain to fall on these higher elevations where that condensation is very intense. I'm just going to show a brief example of monsoonal storms that happen because the land heats up faster than the ocean in the summer, which causes a pressure differential and the moist air above the ocean tends to want to move to that hot air above the land because hotter air can hold more moisture. 
Now, part of the reason why the Madrian Skylands are so diverse is because they sit in the middle, right between the Colorado Plateau and the Sierra Madre Occidental, which is a major mountain range in Mexico. So they get a variety of species from each. So let's talk a little bit about those animal species. There's over 450 species of birds, over 100 species of mammals, and around 100 species of reptiles. I'm gonna go over some favorites from each category. Right here is a Rivoli's hummingbird. Next we have an acorn woodpecker. Then we have an elegant trogon. Here's an Ela monster. Love these dudes, they're so cute. And we have a western diamondback rattlesnake, a little less cute. And we have a horned lizard, also called a horny toed lizard, which I think is kind of funny. And we have a classic American black bear. And we have the cutest animal on earth, a Kodamundi. Love these guys. And then, weirdly, we have jaguars in this section of the country that naturally roam here. Super beautiful. Now that we've talked a bit about the ecology and geology of the major skylands, let's talk a little bit about their native inhabitants. So here we have the Maricopa tribe which were known for their basket weaving as well as their textiles and pottery. Here's an example of the pottery. Another tribe was the Tohono de Orem. They were known for their agriculture as well as their canal building for agricultural systems. Another major tribe in the region was the Apache peoples, who were most notably known for putting up a great defense against the U.S. expansion into the West. They really resisted hard. Here is their one of their warrior leaders, Geronimo, who put up many battles against the U.S. government until he was eventually captured near the Madrian Sky Islands in 1886. Now, the native history of southeastern Arizona cannot be told without including one of the most horrific massacres in Native American history within the Arizona region, the Camp Grant Massacre of 1871, so things start off with Chief Eskiminzen of the Aravipa Apaches moving his 500 peoples to the Camp Grant area, which was maintained by a Lieutenant Royal Whitman at the time. He wanted to move his people to the area so that they could farm a creek nearby and set up a camp, which Whitman permitted. Around the same time, a different tribe couple miles away, ransacked a train, killed two men, stole mules. A month later, they potentially kidnapped a Mexican woman, and this sparked a lot of outrage in the nearby emerging city of Tucson. And then, a couple months later, a man was seen stealing 19 cattle from a nearby ranch. He was followed by Papagos Indians, who notoriously disliked the Apache, who followed and killed the man and identified him as an Aravipa Apache. After this, more outrage was sparked, and a group of 48 Mexicans, 6 Americans, and 94 Papagos natives gathered in Tucson and made their way to Camp Grant. They happened to arrive when the majority of the Apache men were out on a hunt and Whitman was away. They ended up massacring eight men, 110 women and children, and kidnapping 28 babies to sell into slavery. Only one woman was left alive. Back in the late 1600s, 1692, missions like San Xavier del Bac were established in order to convert the native populations to Christianity, led by Spanish missionaries. This was followed by a period in the 1800s where there was a lot of ranching and mining. Here's the mining town of Bisbee, and this is the lavender pit mine that was established in the 1800s that was specifically meant mainly for the purpose of extracting copper. Now for the lighter and fun stuff, let's talk about some of the magnificent hiking in this region. Right here we are looking at Chiricahua National Monument in the very southeastern corner of Arizona in the Chiricahua Mountains. This was formed by an ancient volcano that exploded and formed the Turkey Creek Caldera, which layered down a bunch of ash that eroded away and left these really cool hoodoos. 
This is an absolutely wonderful collection of hoodoos. They look a lot more girthy and a lot more dynamic than the ones that you would see in Bryce Canyon. There's a lot of cool ones that are balancing on stuff. There's entire valleys where it's just spikes everywhere like this picture here. It's a phenomenal area and it's a really good way to walk through those Sierra Madre Occidental Pine Oak forests that I was discussing earlier. Here we have a different mountain called Mount Wrightson, which is a little further inland from the Arizona-Mexico border, uh, right outside of the town of Green Valley. Super beautiful area, absolutely stunning views of the peak when you're heading up there. I head all the way up to the top when I was there. Some absolutely gorgeous scenery of the forests and the uh, chaparral biome that you go through. A uh, really dynamic, really cool hike with some very sweeping views of Arizona, and you can even see all the way from Mexico if you're high enough on these peaks. It's uh, just a fascinating area in general, and you're not going to see much people on the trail. Uh, when I was on the peak this one day, I think in May, which is a really perfect time to hike, there was nobody there. Here next in Saguaro National Park, we have Rincon Peak, which I think is a great peak to just show you the sheer amount of biome difference in the Madrian Sky Island region. So this hike starts you off like all the way at the bottom of this mountain, and you hike through almost every single life zone. It starts you off in those oak grasslands, and then you just make your way up through the chaparral, into the oak woodlands, into the pine oak, into the pine forest, into the mixed conifer biome at the top. It's a really dynamic, really versatile hike, and since you have to hike so far, not many people are back there. And so next we have Miller Peak in the Huachuca Range right outside of Sierra Vista. This is where the start of the Arizona Trail runs through. Super beautiful area. Again, you're not going to see much people hiking through this area, especially when you take that Miller Canyon trail up to the top of Miller Peak. This is another one of those hikes where you can see a lot of the life zones, and if you come at the right time of year, you're going to see a lot of color-changing oak and sycamore along the creeks. Here we have Patagonia Lake. No, this is not the Patagonia in South America. This is Patagonia in Arizona. Still very beautiful. This was pictures I took right around the time of monsoon season, so just a beautiful time to be there. Lots of flowers popping about. It was just a really gorgeous time to go. Lots of good wine country there, too. Here's some pictures from Coronado National Monument, named after Francisco de Coronado, who was one of the first European colonizers to really explore this region. Nearby, you have Ramsey Canyon, which has one of the highest densities of hummingbird species anywhere in the U.S., with super beautiful views and a nice year-round creek going through it. And then this is just a really nice picture that I took out of the town of Bisbee, Arizona, up in the highlands. Uh, I think that area is absolutely stunning looking down into Mexico. Thank you all so much for watching. I know this was a longer video, but thanks for sticking in there. This right here is a picture of some waterfalls you can see in Saguaro National Park if you go at the right time of year. So I hope this video encourages you to check out the Madrian Sky Island region. It's, it's really a region of the U.S. that is close to my heart. Uh, just a reminder to get out and hike. And as always, the links for everything, all the sources and all the hikes is down below. Thank you so much for watching.